Anybody know what that means? Okay, what's it mean? 50th day. It's the 50th day after Passover. And it was uh, established as a Jewish holiday, a Jewish festival, according to the book of Leviticus. And we are celebrating that today. It's got a new title. The, Jew, the Jewish people do not call it Pentecost. That's a Greek moniker. Uh, actually, it's called the Feast of Weeks. Seven weeks and one day after the summer, the spring harvest is Pentecost. So that's what this particular Sunday is. And what makes it so particularly important and distinctive is that on a Pentecost day, after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit came down like a freight train on the Christian community and did some marvelous things. So that's kind of where we're focusing our attention in our songs and in our uh, scripture readings and in our, our uh, sermon and like that today. Also, last night there was a tremendous event. It was a great festival of life. It was the wedding of Charles and Julia, and it was a great event. It uh, happened in the rain, but it didn't seem to dampen our spirits or anything. It was a great event. Yeah, and we're missing, uh, we're missing uh, several people who are probably still in bed. Uh, after that event because I think it went pretty late and I see a few of you who went the distance that are still here God bless you for your faithfulness to do that um, and notice that the flowers these beautiful flowers we have the cross the, sh the flower arrangement in the shape of a cross right here in front of the pulpit and the one over in the corner over here and also there's a placard here uh, right in front of Nancy and, and Charlene and also a cross there and those, those were all features of the wedding ceremony last night. We need to, Bonnie. Family camp registration. Thank you, Bonnie. And I have I have several. Uh, registration forms for all the other camps in the office if you'd like to have them. Otherwise, you can get them online at GrandMesaBaptistCamp.com, right? And uh, you have to print them there. You cannot, uh, it's not interactive. You just print the form off the website. Hey, are we, is there going to be a fellowship meal? Uh, by, uh, Nancy seemed to think that the, the pickings were rather slim downstairs, so... I didn't know if there was going to be a fellowship meal of bread and water or something. I don't know. Nathan? <laughs> okay. So let's say if you go downstairs and you don't see any food, maybe you just want to go home. <laughs> Have a cup of coffee and go home. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, I'm not sure there's going to be a fellowship meal. Rhonda? Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you for looking after the Stansbury family. Awful tragedy in their life. Three-year-old son was run over by a, a vehicle and died. Um, yes, thank you. Please remember to pray for them as well. Yeah. I don't see Cherie here today, so I guess that means that there's no Christian education meeting either today. All right. Whatever. Tomorrow, Memorial Day is observed tomorrow, so I hope that you will remember those people who paid the highest price for our freedom and probably other people who have passed on who are in your families. There's a Grand Mesa Camp work day this coming Saturday beginning at 9 o'clock up on the Grand Mesa Camp site. And uh, so if you can help us get the camp open, that would be fabulously and wonderfully appreciated. 
All right. Uh, any other information we need to share? Go ahead, Sandy. He's, he's back home, Sandy. Came back home. Thanks for a heads up on him. Please remember to pray for Bob. He's having some health difficulties. Elijah, it's wonderful to see you here with your dad today. And I know that you're about to head off to California on a big trip. So welcome to you. We're very glad you're with us today, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, lucky for you, Ramona. You get a seat. Okay. Hey, let's worship the Lord. That's why we're here. Remember, the songs that we're singing today are about that Pentecost event and the coming of the Holy Spirit into the world. And because the Holy Spirit is in the world and in us, uh, we are more powerful than our, our arch enemy, Satan. Right? That's the testimony of this particular song. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Please stand as we sing it. Do I have oh, <coughs> one and two and three and four and two and two? This isn't the one. This is the one, two, three. I wrote it on the wrong one. One, two, three, four, <laughs> two, two, okay. three, four. <laughs> trying to drum the country right out of him. <laughs> okay. Hey, here's a, a, good old, a good old song that most of you who have been in the church for a while are going to know this one. It's called Pentecostal Power. Lord, send the Pentecostal power that to happen on that Pentecost day. Lord, we need it again. And don't we? Isn't that the truth? We need the Holy Spirit to come here and light a little fire under us and get us going. So, uh, Lord, uh, send that old-time power, that Pentecostal power, 
that sinners be converted and your name glorified. One, two, three, four, two, two, three. Okay. What are we doing? Uh, pick up to the refrain, right? Okay. Let's try it again. One, two, three, four, two, two. Pentecost. It's just called the Spirit Song, and we're throwing this one at uh, Charlene because Jamie called in sick today. So, <laughs> Charlene, just do your level best I'll with it on the Spirit Song. Everybody else, join us on the refrain, please. On the Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lambs. Okay. One, two, three, four, two, two. <clears throat> Thank you. 
as your hearts are filled with joy. Lift your hands in sweet surrender in his name. Oh, give him all your tears and sadness. Give him all your years of pain. And you'll Thanks, everybody. Find your way back to your place. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Find your way back. Hey, for those of you who missed the wedding thing uh, last night, I got to tell you that we had some pretty wild dancers in our group. They're all sitting right out there. You know, it's, it's kind of dangerous to be out on the dance floor with them. You never know who's going to nail you with a, you know, a kick here or something. Oh, the flattery will get you every, everything. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I tell you, I tell you what. I went to bed at about one o'clock last night, and my heart was going. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't slow it down. 
Hey, yeah. Uh, you guys want to say anything about the gathering? Anybody who was at the gathering last night, the wedding gathering? It was beautiful. Yeah, it was a beautiful it event. Was beautiful. It was beautiful. Even with the rain. By Julia time, you mean like 40 mi 45 minutes after the wedding was supposed to start? Yeah. It started like that? Yeah, I, I would say something. Yeah. I, I mean, it was neat uh, seeing him in a wonderful event at St. Charles. And it was very, very meaningful for a lot of his rooming buddies to, to come and be there. And, and you know, as we wrap things up, without any promptings, and let me just say, again, thank you for sending us in that work. And these people are leaving and not saying, you know, you clever best man speech I gotta tell you that wasn't all he said but that was one of them hey uh, look with me please in the Acts the second chapter and yeah Acts the second chapter again this is on that Pentecost day you know when the Holy Spirit came down with a tremendous power and he enabled the disciples to speak languages they never learned they preached the gospel to all these different language groups of people that were in Jerusalem at the time and they, they were basically 
they were basically preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is salvation in Jesus Christ, right? This is what they were preaching in the language that, they, that God gave them to speak, the Holy Spirit gave them to speak. And then after that, all of that happened, Peter stands up. He's got this big crowd of people who's gathered to see what's going on, and he begins to preach a sermon to them. And I'm going to pick up that sermon at verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, Each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. For God's promise was made to you and your children and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. It's a promise, and God's keeping it. Verse 40, Peter made his special appeal to them, and with many other words he urged them, saying, Save yourself from the punishment that is coming on this wicked people. I think the King James Version says, on this wicked generation. Many of them believed his message and were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to the group that day. They spent their time in learning from the apostles and taking part in fellowship and sharing in fellowship meals and prayers. Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles, and everyone was filled with awe. Verse 44, all the believers continued together in close fellowship and sharing their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to what each one needed. Day after day, they met as a group in the temple and they had their meals together in their homes, they eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. An incredible sentinel event in the life of the church. I mean, God just kick-started his church, and it took off, and it spread throughout the whole world. And you and I are beneficiaries of that uh, gospel spreading into the world. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the way you do things. You are incredible. You are, you are a marvelous engineer and a planner and the way you make things work out according to your will. Father, we are part of your creation and we don't always know where we fit into it, but Lord, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would come on us and enable us and empower us to fulfill this purpose that you have for us. Hear our prayer, God. We give you praise and glory. It's all about you. Speak to us, Lord, whatever your messages are, speak them with clarity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite forms of humor is, is a blooper. A blooper. You know what a blooper is? A blooper is one of those things that just falls out of a person's mouth that they didn't intend to say, and it turns out to be really funny to everybody who hears it and in total embarrassment <laughs> to anyone who says it. <laughs> okay, good one, Chris, good one. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, you know, they happen in radio, they happen in television, they, they happen uh, at, uh, mm, 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 you know, uh, live performances, and they also happen during sermons. They do happen, I have my share, I have said my share of bloopers. And you know, once they fall out of your mouth, you can't do anything about it. It's out there. Uh, let me tell you about what happened to one of my friends, a, a colleague in ministry. We were in a crusade, uh, con conducting a crusade in an auditorium of a bunch of people, and he was introducing a song that he was about to sing, a song of faith that he had written. And he wanted to address the problem that Christians have conflicts with each other, you know, and how uh, he was appealing to them to resolve these conflicts. So he meant to say, some of you out there are fighting. But instead of that, he said, some of you out there are passing gas. <laughs> that word. 
He didn't say fighting, he said, okay, all right. And then there was a dead silence in the auditorium until somebody way in the back went, ur, 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 ur. and then the, the giggles all over the, the auditorium, you know. Once that falls out of your mouth, you can't take it back. Uh, oh, Lord, I'm telling you. Uh, my parents had a collection of uh, records, uh, you know, um, LP vinyl records, you know, back in the, in the dark ages. And one of them were, were bloopers from the 1940s and 50s about radio and television. And in, if you know anything about radio in the 1940s, they didn't have any of those little recorded things, you know, you just plug in and play a little advertisement or you plug it in and, and it, uh, it does a segue for you. They didn't have any of that stuff. So that all had to be done live on the air. So uh, one of my favorite bloopers on this little collection was done by an NBC announcer. The announcer reads all of the commercial advertisements, and the announcer also segues from one program to another, right? He was a, an announcer for the National Broadcasting Company, NBC. And he was coming up to the top of the hour and was the end of a, of a religious programming. And he meant to say, Cast your bread upon the water. This is the National Broadcasting Company, right? right? That's what he meant to say. But he got in such a hurry, he said, cast your broad upon the water. This is the National Breadcasting Company. <laughs> <laughs> I love those bloopers. They're just, they just tickle you, you know, as long as it's not you saying them. You know, it's really funny. Uh, and bloopers can also be in print. Lots of bloopers in print. You know, you change one letter and you get something really funny. Or the context of things. For example, someone saw a sign outside a church in Arkansas. And on the top of this big billboard, it says, Seven Springs Baptist Church. And underneath it says, Today's sermon, Have You Ever Been to Hell? <laughs> and right underneath it in big letters, it says, Visit Us. Uh -huh. that's, a, uh, that's, that's a contextual problem there. Uh, hopefully, our worship gatherings are going to be at the opposite end of the spectrum, I hope. Author and pastor Art Greer wrote, Most people enjoy worship gatherings because, quote, it's the only place bad things can't happen them, to them for an hour in the week. You know, that, that dates it, doesn't it? Well, he goes on to say, the toilet doesn't back up. The sink doesn't run over. The phone won't ring. Definitely dated. And the school principal can't call you and say, I've got your son in my office. Come get him. <laughs> the only price you have to pay for an hour of bliss is the possibility of being bored by a preacher. <laughs> oh, I have such tremendous power to bore you. I'm sorry. I hope I don't bore you. I'll try not to do that. You know, um, actually... A worship gathering is really a time when we express our admiration for God, our admiration for God. We just tell God the truth about who he is and we admire him. It's a time when we hopefully sing songs of, of faith and, and sometimes every once in a while we learn something new and every once in a while um, we are encouraged to be better people in a worship gathering, huh? And I hope that happens here with regularity. However, it is probably true that our particular worship experiences aren't quite as exciting as those were on that Pentecost day when the Holy Spirit came down with such force and such impressive uh, phenomena. Uh, Christian believers on that Pentecost day uh, preached gospel. They preached languages in languages they never learned. Believers by the thousands accepted the gospel on that day. Miracles were being performed everywhere by these apostles. And acts of love and kindness, they were happening all over the place. And everyone, the scripture says, everyone had a high opinion of the, them. God. Yeah. When's, when's the last time the world had that high opinion of the church? <laughs> it was a revolutionary experience. People sold their possessions. Can you imagine that happening in America? 
we'd all run out and sell our homes and our cars and distribute the money to other people. Can you see that happening in this day and age? Christians met together, they ate together, they studied together, they worshiped the Lord together. That first church was full of life. Wow, what God was doing with it. When I read about the first, the beginning of the church here in Acts chapter 2, I'm reminded of a letter that appeared in an issue of the Smithsonian Magazine. The magazine, editors of the magazine, had asked their readership to send them stories about their first visit to the Smithsonian. How you doing, Kelly? You took rain in there, right? To some of it, yeah. To some of it, yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, so people were invited to send their letters about their experiences. One of them uh, who responded was a woman named Verna. Verna wrote about her first visit to the Smithsonian with her nephew, who was eight years old, and it was August of 1976, bicentennial year. You know, buntings all over the place, flags all over the place, a great uh, sense of patriotism in Washington, D.C. They entered into a small gallery, and there in the middle of it, they saw a man seated in a chair who appeared to have dozed off reading a newspaper. Just before Verna and her nephew came into the room, Verna had read about, read an article about a guest sculptor named Dwayne Hansen, who had been given the right to place his sculptures all over the museum, wherever he wanted to put them. And that they were so lifelike, they had clothes, normal clothes on them, and they even had working wristwatches on them. Right? And the article also indicated that people had been walking through the museum talking to them, thinking that they were real people. Right? So Verna and her nephew stood in front of this admiring, dozing man, this dozing man, commenting on how lifelike his details were. And at this point, the nephew reached down and pushed his sleeve up in order to see the working wristwatch to see what time it was. Of course, and to his shock, the sculptor raised his head and mumbled something and offered them his newspaper. <laughs> At which point, the terrified boy ran out of the room screaming, He's alive! He's alive! <laughs> What's my point? Thank you, Charlie, for sharing that with us, uh, that we can embarrass Brenda with it. So you know what that's like, Brenda, firsthand, to think that you're, in, you're looking at an inanimate thing and suddenly... Well, he's seen it silver. There, everything oh. is silver, and you can uh, touch silver. You would not think it was regular gold. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's, what's my point here? When others... Look at us. When others look at us, as a church, what do they see? Do they see a church that is alive with faith and love? Or do they mistake us for a dozing sculpture when they look at us? What do they see? The first Christians were not only filled with life, they were brimming with love for one another. They spent every waking hour together, the scripture tells us. They sold what they owned. They shared the money with other Christians who had less. Jesus said repeatedly about Christians, what did he say about us as his followers? By this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you love each other. And these first Christians, they were taking that to the extreme. They loved each other and they really showed it. I'd like to encourage us to consider that it is always right and always a goal for us to cherish and maintain and nurture our love for God and each other. It's our defining characteristic. If we do this, the world is never going to mistake us for a dozing sculpture or anything else.
but the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those first Christians, they were brimming with love for each other. They practiced their love in every way, a godly, in every godly way. They loved each other. Wow. In the 1950s, there was a writer and publisher named Bennett Cerf. Any of you people who are over 40 know who Bennett Cerf is? I remember him because he used to be a contestant on that nighttime program, What's My Line? Any of you remember it? Okay. Bennett Cerf was invited to become a guest on a panel on a program called Conversation. It was an NBC program. And the panelists were all asked to spend the entire 30 minutes of their radio program talking about what they were most afraid of. Right? 1950s. Harry Charles, what are they going to be most afraid of? Holidays, nuclear war. Annihilation by nuclear war. We're right in the middle of the Cold War. The Russians have nukes. The United States have nukes. And just one nervous person with a trigger finger could end it all. It's what most of the people were afraid of most. But Bennett Cerf sat there and said nothing. And near the end of the program, the convener of the group looked at him and said, you know, Bennett, you haven't said anything. That's very unusual. Bennett Cerf said, greatest fear, huh? It's, it's not polio, which is everywhere right now. And it's not nuclear annihilation. No, my greatest fear is not being loved, he said. Not being loved. Bennett Cerf was a man who didn't know if anyone truly loved him or not. You know, uh, some things are, are timeless. That's 1950s. We've come a long way since the 1950s, and things have changed a lot over and over and over again. But you know what? It's still the greatest fear of some people is not to be loved. There's nothing too mysterious about people. We need love, and we need to be loved. We want to be recognized as people of worth. We want others to think well of us. We want to need to belong somewhere. Anybody think that's true? I think that is still true. We have a wonderful opportunity as a Christian family to create a community of love where people can truly find his or her place in it. We have an opportunity to do that. Let's always cherish and maintain and nurture our love for God and for each other above all things. You know, God set off and sparked a revival using just a handful of disciples back in the first century. God can start a new revival beginning with one person. One person who truly loves. One person truly filled with the Spirit of God. And revival can happen. It can happen with us. Let me give you an example about that. Some of you have read the, some of you may have read the book "Through the Valley of the Kauai," written by Ernest Gordon. The book tells us about the time he was imprisoned in a Japanese prisoner of war camp during World War II. Ernest and the other POWs in this Japanese camp were ordered to build a bridge over a river called Kauai. It's a, such a famous book, they made a movie out of it. But let me tell you about the details of his book. Ernest tells us, now, you would think that POWs in a camp would really bond together. Wouldn't you think that? You know, wouldn't they really bond together? This is our enemy out here. We're together in this. We need to bond together. Ernest Gordon tells us that the POWs didn't do that. The conditions were so poor in this POW camp that they all turned against each other. It was just survival. Who could steal whose food or water? They betrayed each other. The conditions were so bad. And one of the soldiers said, listen, none of us is going to survive this experience if we don't do something about that. We've got to stop being against each other. So they formed a buddy system. Two guys together watching each other's back. 
And this improved that situation a lot. Well, in the middle of all of this situation, one of the soldiers became deathly ill. I think he had malaria or dysentery, I'm not sure. Diphtheria, maybe. And the Japanese, what they would do is if one of the prisoners became ill, they would put him in what was called a hot house. It was just a bamboo hut. They'd put him in the hot house, wouldn't feed him, wouldn't give him water, wouldn't give him shelter, wouldn't give him medicine. They'd just put him in the hot house, and if he died, they'd just burn the hut down. That's well, yeah, that's an easy solution to that problem, isn't it? And everybody watched all through the week to see that when this, when this guy was going to die. But at the end of the week, to the amazement of everybody, the soldier walks out, apparently healed and strong and ready to go. And everybody was amazed at that. Here's the rest of the story. Like Paul Harvey says, here's the rest of the story. This soldier survived because his buddy had been keeping him alive. He would steal bread from the Japanese soldier mess, which would get him killed. And he would take it to his friend in the hothouse. And he took his own food, and he gave it to his buddy in the hothouse. And at night, he would sneak out of his barracks, which would get him killed. And he took his blanket to his buddy in the hothouse. And he kept him alive. So at the end of the week, he came out of there well. Unfortunately, in the process of taking care of his buddy, he himself became deathly ill. He was put in the hot house and two days later died. And they burned the hut down. Now that's pretty tragic, isn't it? It's amazing on one side of it. It's tragic on the other. But as a result of this one selfish act of love, the entire POW camp changed its attitude. And they had a revival in their camp. And they turned back to the faith they once had. And they drew together. And when, when their rescuers came to them at the end of the war, they found a vital Christian community meeting together in worship and caring for each other in remarkably selfless ways. All because one Christian acted on his genuine love for another. This is Christianity at its best, is it not? Yeah. At its best. It's the way it began in the first century, and it's the way God wants it in the 21st century, I guarantee it. So dear friends, let us always cherish, maintain, and nurture our love for God and each other, and May we never be mistaken for a dozing sculpture. Okay? All right. Okay. Could we ask our ushers to receive our tithes and gifts? Nancy, what are you going to play? It's a little medley? Okay, thank you, Nancy.
as I am and old rugged cross, and then it went back to just as I am at the end. Thank you, Nancy. That was beautiful. Yeah, how's that, Dwayne? You're welcome, man. That's Dwayne's favorite song. Thank you, Nancy. Hey, let's conclude our worship time by singing a song, 85 in your book, or Chris will put the lyrics on the wall for us. Come Holy Spirit. It's a good uh, Pentecost concluding song. 85. Please stand as we sing it. Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. All right. God bless you as you go from this place and carry the gospel of the Lord in your world. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>